Hi. Um, I'm just going to start with something I wrote. I feel I exist on the boundaries, somewhere between science and art, art and architecture, public and private, east and west. I'm always trying to find a balance between these opposing forces, finding the place where opposites meet. I love water, and water is something I use a lot. From one of the first wave fields to a piece called Untitled Topographic Landscape to even a piece made out of cast blown rocks, cast glass rocks called Dew Point, or a piece that can't make up its mind if it's water or land. From the front approach, it looks like a wave. From the back, it looks like a hill. So there's an ambiguity or another piece for this same show that gave you a relationship to water. I took the southernmost island in the Atlantic, Bouvet, and I drew it as a, a drawing in space called Waterline. Or another piece near where we are in Colorado called Blue Lake Pass, where I took stratified layers and pulled it apart so you could walk through the earth. Or still yet, bodies of water, the Caspian Sea, or the Red Sea. I'm a very committed environmentalist. I have been since I was a kid. And little by little, in my art at least, I've begun to reveal things that maybe you're not thinking about. What's below the surface? Or better yet, this is Manhattan's waterways, the Long Island Sound, the Hudson. We tend to not think if it's upstream or downstream. We tend to pollute even what we don't own. This is the Chesapeake Bay, very interested in studying waterways that are much about looking at things differently. This is the upper Everglades, what's left of the Everglades, the Kissimmee River, or still yet the Yangtze River again in Pins, which is in the US consulate in Beijing, or still yet you can eat under the California Academy of Sciences new museum, and you can eat under San Francisco Bay. It's another drawing in space. That's actually Angel Island. Um, still yet, this is a piece I did for Storm King called The Wave Field, the third in the series. Waves go about 18, 20 feet high, so you can get lost in them. It's almost like stopping time to something I'm working on right now. It's called a fold in the field. I get to play a lot in the mud, in the dirt. So this one's in New Zealand. It's on its way to being done. The folds are about 60 feet high. And it, it's in between sort of abstracting landscape but also playing with it, creating motion. It's based on a piece I did called Flow. But just to confuse you, I also do architecture. And I couldn't <laughs> talk today just about one or the other. But I'm not going to talk too long. I'm just going to talk. I'm actually not going to talk about the architecture. I'll just show you a few. And again, maybe straight and curve. It's that tension between that boundary line. I'm also working on a research facility in Cambridge that's ongoing right now. The bottom scrim stone wall almost looks like coral, is much more natural. The punched openings in the glass, though mim mim mimicking it, actually talk more about how science takes the natural and, and systematizes it in a way. So that's ongoing. And I'm now going to start about the memorials, which is the last leg of the tripod. And I think of my work as being pretty much a tripod. You can't talk about one without talking about the other two. The memorials, though, are a hybrid in between art and architecture. And I've often said that my art is like writing a poem. And my architecture is like writing a novel. And I truly believe that. The memorials, though, are this in-between state. They have functionality, but their function is purely symbolic. These memorials, and there will be five in the series, and I'm working on my fourth and fifth, and I'll end with the last, take three to five years, maybe 10 years of research. So there's a lot of writing and research that goes into them. And then I put it all away, and I wake up one morning. This one actually started in, a, in mashed potatoes after I saw the site, after I had researched it for months. Time, beginning and end meet at the beginning, civil rights, open-ended, 
where the words are, 54, Brown versus, Brown versus Board of Education, 268. But again, the time gap left open represents all the time future, in the future and in the past for civil rights. The women's table at Yale, it's not about a memorial per se, but it does document the number of women enrolled at Yale from when there were none to the year I put it in, so it starts with a lot of zeros. The funny thing is the first number 13. The story behind this is it's Street Hall, which is the Yale School of Art. Mr. Street had two daughters. He had one condition when he built the building. So we researched maybe for three years what is a women's table or an artwork at Yale to commemorate women at Yale. I just traced the number of women enrolled at Yale from when there were none to the day I put it in. I'm working on, as I said, my fourth and my fifth memorials. This one is the Confluence Project. Native American tribes intertwined with the history of Lewis and Clark along the Columbia River, as well as intertwining the ecology of the place. I accepted the commission reluctantly, not because I didn't care about it, but because I was about to start my fifth memorial on extinction, and I was afraid it would, it would trip me up. In a way, they're twinned and they're paired. They're both multi-sided memorials. They both require a real intertwining of human history with ecological history. So for this one, I'm not going to get into it that much, but how do I end? I'm in the state of Washington. I can end where Lewis and Clark ended at the Pacific. This is Cape D. And I'll only tell you that a lot of what we've done here is we have questioned why we have put parking lots where there was once an ocean view or restrooms. We've been able to convince state parks, national parks, Forest Service, and Army Corps that you'd really rather restore a native dune back to its native grasslands. Notice there's no parking lot and the restroom facility is pushed over. But we intertwine the history of Lewis and Clark and we use them as a lens rather than objectify them and turn it into be a more memorial about Lewis and Clark, I actually used them because they gave us a time capsule back to what a place was like exactly 200 years ago. And I reflected on that and I intertwined with every site we chose along the river. It was blessed by the tribe whose homelands you're in. And the interactions with that tribe have led to different aspects of the piece. This was the other side of the Cape Disappointment site. Again, you couldn't even see the water. The estuary here is one of the most vibrant in North America at its time. And this is what it looks like today. Or one I chose because they were, the Forest Service was blowing a dam on the Sandy River, so we put in a bird blind, and it bears witness to the river as it returns to its natural course. And in it, are all the, all the species that Lewis and Clark cited, but it also tells you, tells you what their status is today, extinct, endangered, near threatened. Which again leads me to my last memorial, which I'll be working on for the rest of my life. I set up my not own not-for-profit foundation, a commission um, for the California Academy of Sciences and the San Francisco Art Commission allowed me to create the beginning of this project as I made the wire landscape. So what if I could take a memorial and make it go wherever it wanted to go? What if it could be free and you could share it? So this is the first iteration, the listening cone. We've got about 75 one to two minute films donated by the BBC, Nat Geo, Cornell Anthology, and they're playing inside. Or this, an empty room that's a traveling exhibit exhibit, or we took over the MTV billboard two years ago with creative time. We'll create sound rings. And again, we're focusing on endangered species, but also the habitats they need to survive. What's missing? The scale of species. Or the fact that Atlantic cod were larger than men in the 1800s, and little by little, we've diminished them in both size and quantity. Or the abundance of species that the fact that in New York Harbor, lobsters were six feet long and oysters measured a foot. So what do we do? We have a website, it's called What is Missing? It will contain a map of the past, the present, and then the future. And we just launched the map of the present and the past together. The map of memory and conservation in action. And every dot tells a story of the natural world. At this point, past, and present. 
you can see it geolocated, but you can also see it in time. So you can click on a dot and find out a story. There are over 600 historical entries, like the one about six-foot lobsters. There, we're inviting anyone to give us a personal memory of something they've personally witnessed disappear from nature. And we, you can go into Manhattan and other places where there's like 50 entries of what a place was like from when it was first written about till the present day. So just to give you an idea in that Manhattan wormhole, sturgeon were so plentiful in the Hudson River, they were nicknamed Albany beef. Or this is a memory someone gave us. And there are cards here, please give me a memory. You can go online and do it. Um, someone having dinner on the ice in Newport, again, hasn't been seen since the, for 30 years. Or someone in India gave me this about growing up in herds of antelopes making your, your car stop for 15 minutes. Did go public with the map of memory, which launched last year, because I made a promise that it would be about what you could do. So this last Earth Day, and I only surfed on Earth Day, came conservation in action. We've linked to over 30 environmental groups, um, from Audubon to NRDC to CI. We're showing you what they're all doing to help. This is WWF, they're a lead partner, as well as Cornell. But it also tells you what you can do. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. For 25 cents, you have a choice. Coffee, the second most traded good around the world today. On the right, shade grown, what it does for species is huge. It costs you 25 cents more. Any one of us can do it. Or the largest crop grown in America. We don't eat it. It's the American lawn. More oil is spilled each year refueling lawn equipment and just think about the pesticides in your footprint. So what if you gave half your lawn back to nature? That's all it would take, create habitat. So think local and global at the same time. What we're trying to get to is deforestation and preventative deforestation. 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions is caused by deforestation. Cheapest fix in the world. We can save two birds with one tree. Thank you. That's it, I guess. <laughs>